Welcome to the Sporting Life Info Goal Euro 2020 Knockout Stage Betting Preview. For all tips, analysis and insight during the tournament, previews of every game, make sure you visit sportinglife.com and don't forget to download our Sporting Life app for iOS and Android as well. Well, we'll dive straight into it. For full disclosure, we're recording this the day after that madcap final night of group stage action. We'll start, though, with England, guys, and the way that all ended last night meant England against Germany in the last 16. How would we sum up England so far in this tournament? Uh, three words, solid but uninspiring. They've looked very good at the back. They've not conceded many chances at all, just 0.6 expected goals against per game. Um, but they've not really got clicking in attack, have they? I mean, all the hope coming into the tournament was that the, the attacking flair that we had, the Fodens, Grealish, um, you know, Sterling, Rashford, Sancho, etc., would fire us to, uh, to Euro 2020. But ultimately, it's the defence that's coming up trumps at the moment. And now we've got Germany and, and then the, the patriotic one on the end will definitely be liking the look of the draw for England after Germany, won't you? Yeah, I think Southgate's made no bones about the fact that he thinks France are the model in terms of international football and that's what he's tried to do and France aren't a harem scarum gung-ho attacking side they're defensive and that's what we've been I think we've been really good <laughs> honestly he's already letting his wee creep in yeah, yeah sorry yeah, yeah. England uh, Jake Pearson been... is a phenomenal betting tips to by the way he just loves England as well I think England have been really good I think people don't enjoy defensive football I think people think defensive football is bad football like when we play Czech Republic, when England played Czech Republic, the first half, England were attacking. We had five shots, Czech Republic had three shots. In the second half, England defended. That's what they needed to do. They had no shots, but the Czech Republic only had two. A 9% chance of scoring on the info goal model. So it's not, we didn't play bad in the second half. England didn't play bad in the second half. England just played a different way, and that is fine. Now throw it to you, Tom. So England... Seven points in the group stage. Last time they did that in major tournament football, 1966. No goals conceded in the group stage. Never done that before. Once yeah. before. He knows. So you take England man. That's the 66 one. Yeah, 66. Yeah. Again. The Omens are there, though. I mean, the Omens are there, yeah. But being honest, if you look at England and the way Southgate wanted to go, the England were going more defensive anyway, right? They were playing with this three at the back system. Obviously, they went away from that, but the whole kind of building point since 2018 and the semi-final appearance of the World Cup has become defen become more defensively solid. I think that was always England's issue. It was never uh, an issue in attack. It was that defensive end they've looked to address that. So going into a tournament with seven points at the end of a group stage, which I think you probably would expect from England, maybe not in the order. You'd say they'd draw with Croatia, probably beat Scotland and Czech Republic. As it turned out, it was the, the Scotland game that ended in the draw. In the draw. We can't be too surprised to see that not conceding a single goal throughout. And as it turns out, Scotland's kind of output was peaked really at the Czech Republic game. It went down since then, the same with Croatia, the same with Czech Republic. So it's not a massive surprise to see uh, no goals conceded. And it's, it's tournament football, isn't it? It's not winning games, it's not losing them. And that's, that's where England are. So in our preview of the tournament, we liked England generally, thought they've got decent chance, don't back them, it's not a value bet to back England, back England to win Euro 2020, what about now? I think the, the way that the draws panned out, it, the, the main thing, for, I probably still wouldn't be backing England to win it at the price, um, I think the best price is 7-1 to one, aren't they? But what is strange is that the price has actually drifted from, I think they were 5-1 to one second favourites at the start of the tournament, they've actually drifted to 7-1. to one. Even though they've come out of the group and they've got an easier or kinder run potentially to get to the final, you know, you play Germany at Wembley as well, which I think was a, something that quite a few pundits missed is the fact that if we won the group, we were guaranteed a last 16 tie at Wembley. England were guaranteed a last 16 tie at Wembley. Um, and then after that, you know, you're looking at um, Ukraine and Sweden. And then after that, you're looking at one of Netherlands, uh, Wales, Denmark or Czech Republic in the semi-final. And I mean, that's a really kind run to the final where you're obviously going to play a really good team given how stacked the other side of the draw is. So yeah, that was the main, the main surprise is the fact that the price has drifted. If they were still around five to one, I think that would probably be a fair representation than the sevens. But I, I, I think the, the price is going to drastically shorten if we beat Germany. If, if England actually go out and beat Germany at Wembley, qualify for the quarters, given the easy run that they're potentially going to have, 
that price could easily shorten and we might even be favourites after that. I mean, France, obviously, they're in the tough side of the draw, so current favourites, but they're going to have to play, play, play and beat the likes of Spain, Belgium, Italy, Portugal, one of those teams. So, yeah, um, seven to one. I said in the, pre, in, the, uh, in the preview from my perspective that if they did drift around the eights, I'd be interested. And I think just before that, um, that final round of group games, they were was it 19, 19 to two, eight and a half. So um, I would have been very tempted to have a nibble, but I think it's just, just on the short side again now. I think seven to one on England's great value. I know we said before the tournament, we were talking about the fact that we weren't looking at England because of the fact they were the same price as England uh, as France. Sorry, so it was England or France. We'd say France have a better chance, but you've got to look at the side of the bracket. They're on England, Netherlands, and Germany. We rub in their hands of the way it's working out, and you know I can't wait for this to appear on one of those out of context accounts when inevitably England do get beat by Ukraine or someone in the quarterfinals. But with great respect, those. Three big hitters on that side of the bracket will absolutely fancy their chances. It's uh, a price that is warped by the fact they are playing Germany, who is such a short price for success anyway. They were short price to win the group. They didn't, and they're very hit and miss, as they've shown. We saw that coming into the tournament. The Spain results, the North Macedonia results, have replicated themselves in the fact that they've kind of gone on this curve of a decent enough performance against France, a good performance against Portugal, a performance against Hungary that just didn't lack any identity whatsoever. Um, so yeah, for, for England, at 7-1, to one, certainly more interested. It's not a case of who you think is going to win. It's playing the, the bracket and the fact they're not going to play Belgium, they're not going to play France, they're not going to play Italy, they're not going to play Spain, they're not going to play Portugal, is it, until the final. They've got a fancy their chance. So at 7-1, to one, it could be a value play. So we do need to get in here pretty early on to admit that in our preview, we thought England would do well but we were just a bit cagey about the price. We didn't think that Wales or Scotland would do well. Scotland, on the nose. Wales, full credit. They've done superbly well in their group. So how would we assess the fact that they've qualified and what do we think they can achieve in the rest of the tournament? Yeah, it's really weird with Wales, I think, because in that first game against Switzerland, they were terrible until that key for more goal. And then that sort of switched everything. And from then on in, they've been really good. It was almost like they needed that goal to go in to give them that lift. Uh, they were really good against Turkey. The Italy game was a little bit... They were never going to beat Italy. But, I mean, they've got, a, they've got to be pretty happy with the draw. They've got Denmark, but I do think Denmark will be too strong for them. I think this will be the end of the road for Wales. But then I said that in the group stage, so, you know, they could beat them. And they could, I think they're... I think they're about 100 to 1, 200 to 1 to win it. <laughs> yeah. 100, 110 to 1, best yeah. right. it's, it's, it's an enjoyable story, Wales, and the fact that we, I think a lot of people wrote them off before because of the factors going into the tournament. And I think we said it in the preview, didn't we? The whole thing about Euro 2016 for Wales was the collective and how together they were. And then going into this tournament, it just didn't seem to be there or it didn't look like it was there. So full credit for them to turn around and say, actually, no, it still is. And after such a shaky start of the tournament as well, like you say that, that first game, it was kind of maybe you could point to that key for more goal and that being the moment where things actually kind of switched to go the other way. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how they get on. I'm not jumping on the bandwagon at all. I th I've been very under underwhelmed with Wales. I think the people are forgetting that the only team they beat was Turkey and Turkey have been ranted in this tournament. I mean, they, they were one of, they're probably one of the worst dark horses we've ever seen at a Euros with their, some of their performances. Um, <laughs> I'm not, no, not looking at anybody. Uh, but Wales, you know, they... they I think the switch that you're talking about is, a, is a, the switching formation from a back three in the opening game against Switzerland to a back four, which has suited them a bit more. But I'm just really worried that they're going to switch back to that back three against Denmark because Denmark do operate with a back three system themselves since the, you know, uh, what happened in, the, in their opening game. And, and ultimately, I think that they'll fall foul if they do do that. And even if they don't, I just don't think they've got enough quality. I mean, yeah, Italy played against them with, um, you know, Wales had 10 men for, was it 30, 40 minutes, but they still racked up loads of chances beforehand. We were talking about the Switzerland game. Switzerland had racked up 2.6 expected goals in that game, which is a, you know, a really solid, um, solid output. And then the other thing that I've, I've, I don't know if you probably noticed as well, I think you definitely did in one of your previews, is that the set pieces, they're quite weak from set pieces. Yeah, that is a huge error. I mean, and then it showed in the Italy game. That's yeah. what they got done by a free kick. I think you quoted the Turkey game in which the likes of Sion Chu and Demiral had so many chances from set pieces. I think they hit the post, had one cleared off the line, Italy had the same. And then you're coming up against Denmark, who've got Yusuf Poulsen, you've got Christiansen, they've got Kjer, they've got ben, uh, Vestergaard. They're all big boys that are going to be dangerous from set pieces. And, and yeah, I agree with, with Jake. I think that's going to be the end of the road for them. And, 
to be honest, if you're looking at a bet in that game, just to, I just back Denmark to win the game. Uh, I think they're a, a very backable price. You've put that in your preview, haven't you? And um, yeah, the, like Tom said, the, the, the issues we had pre-tournament, some of that has been put to, to one side, but I'm still not seeing enough um, from them overall to, to make me think that they can make another deep run as they did in 2016. So away from the home nations then, who else has impressed us in the tournament? And nice opportunity to tee you up here, Jake, that Italy and Spain tipped up in your outright preview before the tournament and both running really well. Yeah, Italy in particular. I think just before the tournament started, people started to take note of Italy. And then after that first game, they were phenomenal. Like you said, it was against Turkey. So, But they've been brilliant in every other game. And their team is so good. Def <laughs> I love them. Defensively, they're so solid. You know, like, That's another meme right there. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're really solid. And they played almost two full games without Chiellini, which is impressive in itself. Midfield is so good. Jorginho has been brilliant. Yeah. I mean, Verratti is to come back in fully. As Verratti well. was fantastic against Wales. Uh, Locatelli, who I thought was the weak link in midfield, actually had one of the games of the tournament against Switzerland, scored two. Uh, Nicola Barella, who has gone under the radar a bit, but I think he's a brilliant player. And then up front, Immobile and even Belotti, they're doing exactly what Kane isn't doing, running deep, running behind, running the channels, stretching defence, and that create so much space for Insignia and Berardi and then Chiesa and Bernadeschi and he knows so all these Italian players, players now, doesn't he? <laughs> They've got so many good players and I think they're looking really strong. Not, not to rain on the parade, but I will just bring up the point that I made in the preview as well. That they're on this really good run, but they haven't played anyone of any stature yet. That is and that's the issue. Like they, they play Austria, I fully expect them to get past Austria, but then you're looking and it does get more difficult and that's when you're going to see what they're made of. That is a fair point and that is why I think, what are they now, 6-1 to one second favourite? That's why I think they're too short there. But No, no I 100% agree, they've been really impressive, yeah. Um, and then Spain, I'll pick, pick up on Spain just from an XG standpoint, they've been phenomenal really. I mean, they, they finished second in the group, but they ranked as the best attacking team according to expected goals. They've averaged 3.3 expected goals per game. I know... You know, they've got Albaro and Morata up front, who does tend to miss a fair few chances here and there. But if they keep creating the chances at the rate that they are, they're going to be difficult to stop. Um, and obviously, they, they would find themselves on the nice side of the draw where, with playing... Oh, actually, no, they're in, in the wrong side of the draw, aren't they? But they've got Croatia, and that should be a very winnable game for them before they, it does start to get difficult. But, yeah, I've been impressed by Spain. Um, you know, I know that they've been playing on one of the worst pitches at the Euros as well in Seville in the sweltering heat, and, um, and you know, they've, they've done what they've needed to. So that definitely one, one that I've been impressed with. Am I right in thinking here, Jake, having written our in-play knockout stage preview, which you can read on sportinglife.com and on our app as well, that... Spain and Italy, as you just alluded to, with Italy, while you've tipped them up anti-post, price quite isn't quite there in play if people wanted to get behind Yeah, it. I wouldn't back them now. I'm happy with the bet, um, as you said, pre-tournament, but I, they're too short now to get on. All over the Netherlands, aren't you? I say, how can we not mention the Netherlands at all at the point where the team were most impressed by? Yeah. Everyone, literally everyone, us included, went Frank de Boer's Netherlands. Right, see you later, lads. Like that's it. You're getting you're getting second to the Ukraine in the in you know Ukraine in the group. They've just been phenomenal to watch. Like, and the great thing was that first game against Ukraine as well. They looked like they, they could attack and they couldn't defend, and it was like these going to be the team you have to watch. But then to their credit, and yes, you could talk about the teams they faced. That there's been clean sheets since there. Um, I just can't believe that whenever we talk about teams that have impressed us, the Netherlands, because we just didn't expect this from yeah, them. Yeah. You talk Spain, I think 9.6, wasn't it? The Netherlands were about 9.0 expected goals yeah, yeah. for. Yeah, three XG per game, yeah. Second yeah. highest in the tournament. Um, we didn't expect that whatsoever. And there's a reward, they're on the, you don't want to say weaker side of the bracket, but they are. And mm. yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of kind of awkward conversations, looks, takes, if uh, the Netherlands when do reach, the trophy. Yeah, yeah, when they get to the final, which is, is a possibility. So they've been so impressive and even more so, I think that we just didn't expect it from them and they're, they're in a really strong position. While the floor's yours, Tom, then, you no, know, it's in Jake's uh, knockout stage preview, really the, the two, if you did want to have a bet, are the Netherlands, who they've just come in overnight from 12 to 1 to 9 to 1, and Denmark, who were as big as 20, 21 to 1 in places to win, which you can back each way with plenty of bookmakers. Would they be the two that you'd have an eye on as well? Or? 
Yeah, I think you apart from England. Yeah. yeah, apart from England, you know, definitely win it. But um, it's uh, you've got to target. You've got to attack that side of the bracket. A hundred percent, you've got to attack it. It's very rare that you can have a tournament that works out like this. So much is made of England's 2018 World Cup run and how that kind of made out the same with obviously Croatia, uh, Belgium, etc. That you've got to look at that in any market. You're not going to get a tournament that often puts the teams that we mentioned, the likes of Italy, Spain, France, Portugal, Belgium, all on one side. As we say, England, Germany, the Netherlands particularly, have just got to be fancying their chances. And for the Netherlands as well, you talk round of 16, they've got the Czech Republic. They then play the winner of Denmark, Wales in the quarterfinals. And then it's potentially England or Germany in the semi-finals that anything to do value-wise with them, you've just got to take on because while it's I'm still reserved, and it is that, that it is De Boer's Netherlands, and it could all go wrong like that, that just the way it could work out for them, there just seems to be more positives than negatives there. And I think if you want value, just to even reach the semi-finals, they were, last time I looked, odds against. Mm. You talk the two games that they've got there, they're going to be favourites to win both. They look a real value player. Yeah. I'll just pick up on Denmark. You mentioned them there. They're worth a mention, obviously. We all know what happened in that first game and, and that emotionally charged them for the rest of the group stage, given that they're in the home, home uh, situation in Copenhagen. But it's worth mentioning that while they did scrape through in second on three points with a better head-to-head -head record, goal difference, whatever, um, they actually won the Group B based on expected points. So they actually cr picked up more expected points than Belgium. Um, which you know is a really good sign in moving, moving forward. They won the XG battle against Belgium. They created more and better chances in that match and have done in the three matches. So they're definitely one to watch. And like you said, it, it's looking likely that it's going to be a Netherlands Denmark quarter final. So you know, it, depending on on who you think's better out of those two, I mean, Netherlands have definitely got more attacking flair and attacking talent. But Denmark is such a good all-round team and a good all-round unit. So that'd be an interesting tie. One to keep an eye on, like you said, the price. I think if we could, we'd talk all day about the Euros. But I'll move us swiftly on to best bets that we could pick out for the tournament. And I'll run through some of the ones that we've still got in play that are doing pretty well. I'll let you start, Tom, because we've got Romelu Lukaku in the Golden Boot that you tipped up, Kevin De Bruyne in player of the tournament, as well as N'Golo Kante and Paul Pogba, players that are looking really good. But if you had one bet now that you were recommending someone to back... Would you be doubling down? Oh, well, I mean, the fact that Pinaldo retweet, uh, trended on Twitter last night shows my issues that I've got with Lukaku and the top goal scorer, Mark. <laughs> the fact yeah. that Portugal got three penalties, Ronaldo scored them all. It was, in, in fairness, I mean, did, La Hoz isn't going to be refereeing all oh, Portugal's no, matches. Yeah, if La Hoz <laughs> could do a Belgium game, that would be great for me, please. Um, yeah, you mentioned the, the player of the tournaments as well. I think uh, three of our outright picks uh, are in the top six in the market. De Bruyne is now favourite. Kante is second favourite in some places, so... They're looking good at the moment, we remain hopeful on them. I've revisited the Golden Boot market. Um, you're not going to get four places anymore. Some bookmakers will give you three, most will give you two. It depends if you take the three places, you're getting quarter odds each way, which I think I'm happy enough with. I've mentioned the Netherlands. Denzel Dumfries is, is yeah. 200 to 1 to be the top goal scorer. Golden a, Boot. A right winner. back. A right back. This is my, yeah, when it, when it comes to crazy suggestions, going for a right back at Golden Boot is definitely up there. But actually, it's not because he's basically playing as a winger when they're attacking. This three at the back system, you can definitely say he's a right midfielder more than a right back. He's got two goals already, got an assist, which is crucial. We talked Ronaldo's chances. Ronaldo has an assist, which could actually be really key if it's a tie. Expected goals-wise, he's on above two. So I think he's going at 0.8 per game, isn't he, XG? It's just incredible. He could have had a goal against North Macedonia as well. He could be in a situation where he's got three. We're talking 200 to 1 is the same price as Dominic Calvert-Lewin. It's the same type of price as kick, yeah. Belletti. It's the same price as Olivier Giroud. Players who aren't even playing and... Depending how it goes, because we're going to lose one of Lukaku or Ronaldo after the round of 16. One of them is going to say Ronaldo doesn't score, five's the marker. Four is probably going to get you a place. Mm. I think if he can get two more, particularly against the Czech Republic, particularly against the Denmark or a Wales, even in, in England or Germany, depending on how it goes. We're talking each way value here, but if he can get to that four marker, you're getting 50 to one. Maybe a bit of dead heat comes into it, whatever. You're definitely getting a lot more than you put down. You love this one. So for 200 to 1... <laughs> I'm fully I mean, on board with it. Wijnaldum well, is yeah. my other one. But for this one, 200 to 1, I just think he's got two goals already. And he's got an assist. Who knows? He could explode in the round of, in the group, in the knockout stages. Get another three, tie it. 
I just think it's just it, the price is too big. The price is far too big on it at the moment. I think 150 is elsewhere, which is you get in two places. Which even then, who knows how it goes? I just think that's that's far too big. Far too big. I'm fully on board with that. that. Just you mentioned the XG there. I mean, that equates to him being on the end of two big chances per game. Which you know, if you get two big chances per game, you're going to take one of them. All of a sudden, your goal tally does increase. So Jake P, you tipped up Belgium to win the group five to six yes. ahead of the tournament. Unbelievable, yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, what about now? Yeah, so in terms of the best bet, I'm going to go the opposite end of the spectrum from the Belgium to win the group at five to six, and I'm going to look into the player of the tournament market. So this all comes from reading Tom's preview at the beginning of the tournament and how he identified the formula for player of the tournament, and it's usually a midfielder from a team that does really well. And I think a team that's going to do really well are Italy. And I think their main man is Jorginho. And he's 80-1 to 1 to be player of the tournament now. And I think he's just been brilliant. He pulls all the strings. He controls the tempo of every match. And he's the kind of midfielder that's getting noticed in modern football. Uh, I think 80-1 to 1 with a couple of bookmakers. You're not worried about Locatelli getting a couple? Brella's got an assist on his I think, last day, I think. The, the reason Jorginho's the better bet, I think, is because they've mixed up the midfield, but he's always been the constant. So Verratti can come in, which might mean Locatelli misses out or Barella misses out. And I think Jorginho's the one that's always going to play. He's always going to be in there. And if they get far and if they control the midfield which they have been doing in every game. If they do that in a semi or in a final and it's him that's doing it, I think he could be a bit. Well, if gets the Austria game as well and they get five penalties. penalties. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. has got five on his tally, it'll look really good. And Jake, oh, he kind of spoiled the game for us when we had the one best bet um, for the last preview. But in fairness, Lukaku, top Belgium goal scorer, 10 to 11, that's doing really well. Belgium, Italy, both win the group, nine to five, already paid out. France winners, um, and Kante, player of the tournament, 75-1 to 1 double, still well in play. Is, are you going to squeeze three in again? Or I've got four got, this time, uh, actually. Yeah, I've got, no, um, yeah I, I, I was struggling to find a, a full-on outright pick that I liked at this stage. So instead, I'm just going to focus on the to qualify market for the la- round of 16. Um, and a treble that tickles my fancy is France to get past Switzerland. Spain to get past Croatia and the Netherlands to get past the Czech Republic and that pays 11 to 10 generally. Um, All those three teams to qualify, they're all really strong favourites. We've spoken about how we like the the Netherlands, how well they played. Spain we've spoken about as well, all their underlying numbers and and, to put into context, Croatia were fortunate to to finish second in that group for their underlying numbers. Um, and Switzerland as well. I mean, the only team they beat was Turkey. And I'll just rinse and repeat what I said about Wales. The only team they beat was Turkey. And how disappointing have Turkey been? So, uh, yeah, that treble, 11 to 10. Um, it, yeah, I, I think that's the way to play this one. Well, thanks for listening to the Sporting Life Info Goal Euro 2020 Knockout Stage Betting Preview. Remember, you can get everything in much more detail on sportinglife.com and by downloading our Android and iOS app. We'll have previews of every match as well as expert insight and tips.